You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to the Catholic Mama, where you'll learn how to deepen and defend your faith, find comfort as we share the vocation of parenthood, and learn how to raise your children confidently Catholic. I'm your host, Christine Mooney Flynn. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Mama podcast. I'm your host, Christine Mooney Flynn. Thanks for joining me today on this episode where I have Dr. Perry Cahall, who is the author of the uh, just released book, Living the Mystery of Marriage, Building Your Sacramental Life Together. He's a professor and dean of a seminary, uh, a Catholic husband and father. Thank you, Perry, so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me, Christine. Yeah, so um, I, I, I loved looking through your book, but before we get there, uh, can you just say hello to the listeners and, and introduce yourself a little bit more? Sure. Um, I am the academic dean at the Pontifical College Josephinum in Columbus, Ohio, a Catholic seminary. I uh, teach uh, both some church history and some sacramental and systematic theology there. I'm a professor of historical theology. I've been uh, married for over 19 years. Uh, my wife and I live in Columbus with our teenagers who are 18 and 15, a boy and a girl. Very nice. And how long have you been um, with the seminary? This is my 15th year with the Josephine. Oh, wow. And prior to that, I was teaching for uh, four years at a small Catholic liberal arts college. Oh, cool. Are you from Ohio? I am. Grew up in the Cincinnati area. Oh, nice. Okay. I, <laughs> I just actually had to type the word Cincinnati for some other project. The other day, talking about the zoo and how they're doing uh, virtual events right now since it's closed to the public. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, some other thing that I'm editing. And I got to tell you, I, I don't know, the ends... There's too many in there. I, I just don't know where That's they go. Right. One of the most misspelled <laughs> cities in the country. It's, got, it's gotta be Chattanooga and maybe that. I just, <laughs> I thought I had it. And then um, I just second guess myself every time. Just like when you, I don't, I have to do it. I say mountain peak or I peek into something. I always have to check the E's and the A's on that one, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have this book coming out uh, or just came out this week, I guess, right? Correct, yes. Um, um, living the Mystery of Marriage, Building Your Sacramental Life Together. Where um, Did this come from the sacramental you know, work that you do and the teachings that you, you do at the college? It did. The, re- the remote origin of it has been the teaching I've been doing over the years. I've taught courses on marriage um, several different places, and I've taught a course consistently at the seminary called Pastoral Care of Marriage and Family. Mm. The more immediate origin of the book is I, I wrote... Um, I wrote another book called uh, The Mystery of Marriage, just The Mystery of Marriage, A Theology of the Body and the Sacrament, which was for classroom use. And um, several people who read that book and used it told me that the last portion of the book, which deals more with spirituality and morality of marriage, could be its own book. They suggested mm-hmm. that I you know, kind of rework it for uh, young couples because they thought it would, would be valuable so I toyed with the idea, talked with the uh, with the publisher and the managing editor, and we made it happen. So um, this is a much more, uh, I hope, um, popular level book that I that the intention of it is that it's of help to both engaged couples, newly married couples, and people who are involved in marriage ministry, deacons, um, directors of marriage and family life offices, pre canid coordinators. So it's trying to hit that audience and. The people I had in mind immediately, to be honest with you, as I was writing this book, is my own children. Mm -hmm. They're 18 and 15. I hope they're not going to get married anytime soon. But my thought, my thought as I was writing each each of the chapters was, um, what do I really want them to know? What would really be helpful to them if God calls them to the vocation of marriage? Yeah. Well, I like that because I mean, even going through where you have kind of a discussion or, you know, thought provoking questions that the reader needs to answer on their own. Um, and then also, you know, questions that might be on your mind. And that, those are some good Q&A ones that may be, um, yeah, yeah, there was a couple in there. I was like, oh, yeah, that is a good question. I, how would I answer that? And that was, that was good to see that. Yeah, so the, those two types of questions, the questions for self-reflection are a way that I hope gets readers to engage, you know, the material. And I had a lot of help crafting those from the Marriage and Family Life Office Director um, in the Diocese of Columbus, her name is Stephanie Rapp, and the Director of the pre cana Program, who's Catherine Supernaw. Um, they were really helpful in crafting those questions. And then the, the questions at the end, the questions that might be on your mind are just questions that have actually been asked to me 
in classes or in talks that I've been given over, have given over the years. So I just thought, well, this is a way to cover some, some frequently FAQs, but uh, frequently asked questions, but to put them in a kind of more user-friendly format, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you find uh, when you were teaching these classes that, um, that the people coming in have the right idea of what marriage really is as a sacrament or, or are they working with more of a, a pop culture frame of reference? Yeah, well, clearly at the seminary, the guys in front of me would have an understanding of marriage as a sacrament and the basic understanding of marriage. But when I've, you know, um, taught previous places or go out and give talks at, uh, even at parishes or in, at engaged uh, gatherings of engaged couples, you really can't presume that people know what marriage is anymore. You know, that I think when, uh, when my grandparents, even my parents, you know, who are the boomer generation, when they got married, there was still enough in the air in our culture to help couples understand what marriage is. Namely, you know, that it's a free commitment where you're going, you're expected to be faithful to each other for your entire life long. And this is about forming a family together. But I don't think there's anything in the air that we breathe anymore, which sends that message to couples. I think in many ways, um, the, the current cultural view of marriage is that it's just a, mutu a, a relationship of mutual convenience, you know, for my mm -hmm. own self-gratification with no vision to children and no understanding of permanence and perhaps fidelity, you know, a little bit. But it's really about a, a, a relationship of mutual self-satisfaction. Yes, right. It's it's more about me and how, how I can be fulfilled rather than, you know, working together with somebody else to form a family and, and get all these all these souls to heaven. Correct. Right. Yeah. I mean, but, when my grandparents especially got married and, and my parents, too, you know, they got married precisely because they wanted to start a family. Hmm. You know, they knew that. You was don't hear that very much. now, do you? <laughs> Right. I mean, they knew that was part of the deal. That's why they wanted to come together. And, and now it's, you know. Sadly, you, you don't hear young couples say that that often. Right. Yeah, I, I gotta say, I mean, I um, I converted to the faith, and so um, my now husband and I did were cohabiting, typical young adult thing. Um, right. Had a baby before we got married, and I remember at the time, I I have extended family who are still uh, pretty Catholic. And my aunt going, oh, oh, thank God. Like really just my prayers have been answered. At least you guys are getting married of some sort at, at one point. It was just a, it was a civil ceremony. So, I mean, she knew that this wasn't the sacrament that it should be. But I remember at the time thinking, well, that's just so old fashioned. You don't, you don't need any of this stuff. But the difference in what, um, uh, and what we've, uh, you know, how we've changed our, the way we just relate to each other is profound since we fully came into the church and, and had our marriage um, blessed in the church. And, and there is, for anybody who's listening, who um, it, it's, it's hard to describe, <laughs> but it, it really is. It became, it, it truly became a covenant. And right. it was, it was something, and of course it didn't just like, you know, snap our fingers. It happened with the priest's words, but because we chose to do that, it became a very intentional and, and we've completely changed how we approach marriage and each other. And it's, it's phenomenal. I'm so, I'm so grateful. I mean, every day I thank God, like you wow, I've literally, Thank you. <laughs> Thank God right. for doing yeah, this. Because before that, I mean, marriage was just, um, it was, you know, a, a piece of paper, a tax write off. It was just a very cynical and uh, unfortunately cynical way of viewing things. Right. And to, to, your, I, to your earlier question, I was focusing on kind of the nature of marriage itself, but this, you're, to, to go beyond that and whether couples think of their marriages as sacraments, I think that's largely not the case. You know, even many Catholic couples don't understand what understanding their marriage as a sacrament implies. You know, that, and, and really couples are blown away when they hear the church's understanding of sacramental marriage, that this is a lifelong sign of God's love in the world. Hmm. That, that's what he intends marriage to be. And, and as one of the seven sacraments that Christ himself instituted, it's not just some type of pious symbol. It's an effective sign. It brings into being what it symbolizes. And what it symbolizes is Christ's loving relationship with his church. And because it symbolizes that, and it, it, Christ is present in that marital union. It's not just like, well, look, this couple is kind of a nice symbol of how Christ No, Christ's love d dwells in that relationship. And he empowers the couple to love with his love. And when you say that to couples, and they start to kind of perk up and think about 
all that this implies that everything they do in their married life together, not just their wedding day, but everything they do during their, their married life together is a sign of Christ's love in which he is really, truly present. Wow. That's a huge difference from the, the cultural view of marriage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah very, very, very different. Um, besides, I mean, I guess after, once you, you know, set the baseline of what marriage actually is, what do you think is either the most um, surprising thing for couples that you've taught or, or the things that you would want them to know the most about marriage once you get past the definition of it? Oh, that's, that's a good question. I think one of the things that I try to bring up in the book is that marriage is, is a vocation to holiness. You know, that I think that's a, a fundamental thing that every, every Christian couple should understand, every, that, that God's calling them together into this union because he wants them to make each other holy. And Christ wants to make them holy through each other. And that they're on this journey, you know, towards heaven together. Their, their mission, should they choose to accept it, you know, and then insert Mission Impossible music, is, you know, that they get each other to heaven. It's a vocation to holiness. So I think that's kind of at the fundamental bedrock level, something that I want every couple, I would want every couple to know. Now, after that, if it is a vocation to holiness then couples need to be, we need to do, a, uh, we need to do our work within the Catholic church to help couples understand that this is a vocation that needs to be discerned. You know, we, when we talk about vocational discernment, we, lar- we normally talk about that in terms of priesthood, religious life, mm-hmm. but marriage is a vocation too. And if it's a call, one needs to, to discern the call and to respond to it wholeheartedly. You know, so you know, priests, the, the young men that I teach in the seminary, they're in the seminary from anywhere from four to eight years discerning their vocation on their, on their journey to their ordination day. You know, many couples are getting married after, you know, six months of engagement and who knows, you know, different periods of time of dating before that. But a lot of times they've not done any serious discernment about whether or not this is, this relationship is actually making them better people, whether this is good for their eternal salvation and not to throw, you know, tons of weight on their shoulders as if this is like something that should, you know, freeze them in, in a moment of indecision. But it is something they need to, have to thoughtfully enter into and thoughtfully discern before they embark upon this life together. So the yeah, call I, to holiness and then discernment. I think those are two fundamental things. I, uh, yeah, that, that's a really good point because I grew up, um, my parents have been married for over 40 years. And so I grew up in a very stable household. I always had a very good view of marriage. But now, you know, once I became married, my mom would say marriage is hard. And that would be probably the only real advice I, I ever got about marriage. I, you know, I, I just didn't really, okay, it's hard. I, I, I guess I'll know what that means when I get there. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I really had this p- picture, especially because we watched a lot of old black and white movies when I was growing up and people would you know, meet and get married within 24 hours and it'd be this fun adventure. I really, right. I, I just thought that was kind of, <laughs> and my, my own parents, I mean, they got married after eight months together. So I really thought that that marriage was this fun adventure and it was hard, but we'll get to that point later. Um, it's interesting about discernment. I, I just never, that's just not everything <laughs> that ever came to mind. So I, I really am uh, uh, fortunate that, I, you know, I, I came into this understanding of marriage and so did my husband and we've been able to work together on it. Um, how would you say that to somebody to discern what, you know, what does that include? Yeah. Well, in general, I think, you know, discernment is the, a prayerful and thoughtful consideration of the option that you're considering, right? So you're, you're, re, you're thinking about re, asking yourself reasonable questions about this option for your life. Right. And then you're taking that to prayer with God, asking him to open your heart to whatever, what he wants. Right. So it's not, and this is not about, as I said, like freezing in a moment of indecision or, or paralysis by analysis, continually thinking, 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 you know, eventually we all have to act and we have to make a decision, but it's making sure that that decision is a thoughtful decision, that it's not something that we have rushed into or that we're making based upon simply emotions and how attractive this other person in, is to me that we're actually discerning whether this woman will make a good wife and mother, whether this man will make a good husband and father, whether this potential spouse is actually making me a better person, right? Or, am, or is this relationship somehow leading us away from God? You know, those are some kind of simple things to think about in terms of discernment. And, and I don't think that, that couples um, 
I don't think it's intuitive, even within the Catholic world, that that couples do this. You know. Yeah, I'm trying to think. As far as you know, my understanding of because I, I again I only came into the the faith a couple of years ago, and I didn't need to go through the um the the pre marriage counseling or anything like that. Um, but yeah, as, as far you know, I've known a few couples who are Catholic and got married, and they would just kind of groan about having to do a pre cana you know, six hour seminar one weekend or something like that. Um, so yeah, yeah. It does, do you feel like the church is missing on, on that kind of ministry or is that, is it just depending on the, the archdiocese or the whatever programs are in place? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, I think oddly the perception of the Catholic church is that it's very structured and regimented and that everybody's <laughs> doing the same thing, but the reality is very different. You know, that, you know, some dioceses have very uh, well thought out, um, pre cana programs, which are really thought about it, are, they're envisioned as formation periods. And you're helping to form this couple for their, not just their wedding day, but for their married life. And, you know, there are other, other programs that are more hit or miss. Um, I think it's, you know, as I mentioned in my book, it's, you know, I think that on the whole, whether it's parish level, diocesan level, whatever, to help couples understand marriage as this vocation to holiness and to discern that vocation is something that we need to be doing as a church, you know, and with our own children as they grow older, you know, and meet prospective spouses that we have them thoughtfully consider this option and not just rush into things. You know, I think, sadly, I think our culture is, is at a, state, a point in time where couples aren't necessarily deciding to get married. They're just kind of drifting. Yeah. You know, and I think this, what I'm talking about in terms of discernment is an antidote to that drifting, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. I had a um, a woman on my show a couple months ago now, and uh, she, Stacey Summero, and she had said that she encouraged her and her husband both discerned religious life. And she was, um, she always advocates that now as, as a good step towards whether or not, it just, it just helps you to better know um, what you're called to. So, sure, right. Do you, is it possible to discern, and I'm asking this because I'm, and I, I actually, it's, it's not really a question for me personally now, but I, I just don't know because I haven't, I wasn't raised in a Catholic household. Is it possible to discern religious life and married life at the same time? That's a good question. I, now I, that would be a, a question better put to probably a spiritual director than to me, but my, my reaction to that is no. I mean, I think that you know, if somebody is feels called to the religious life, their their discernment needs to be focused on that option. It's it's considering one option at a time. You know, it's much, it's too difficult to have different different options on the board at the same time and trying to you know, focus on on one at a time. You know, and if if the religious vocation or the priesthood turns out not to be the glove that fits, so to speak, then it's really actually not possible to discern married life until some prospective spouse presents themselves to you. Right. I mean, because everybody, one of the things I make a point of in the last chapter of the book is that everybody is called to a life of self-giving love. You can't escape it. You can't be human without, without receiving that general vocation. You can't find fulfillment without responding to it. Everybody's called to be, in essence, everybody's called to be a husband and a father and everybody's called to be a wife and a mother. It's just how does that manifest itself? Right. You might not be, you might, it might be spiritual motherhood Correct. versus yeah. physical. You're right. Okay. So, you know, if I'm not called to the vocation of priesthood or religious life, the being called to, a, uh, to married life actually involves somebody being there for me to discern. You know, I can be generally attracted to married life and think, yeah, okay, that's, that's kind of the direction I'm, I'm headed. But discerning marriage actually involves another person. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yes, it's not like it's the opposite. Oh, oh I'm not going to become a religious sister or a priest. Oh, I'll get married. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like it's the yeah. default. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I actually had somebody at one point in time say to me that uh, religious life didn't work out, work out, so they think they'll get married because that, that's easier anyway. And then <laughs> I, we had to have a longer discussion at that point. <laughs> uh, easier. That's, that's a cute idea. Mm-hmm. Now I know marriage is hard, as my mother said, but you know, it, it is difficult. But once you understand like th- that you're getting yourself and your, your spouse to heaven, right. it's so much easier to withhold the sharp word that you wanted to say, or to go out of your way to do something kind and um, that, that might help somebody, you know, your spouse in a moment of need. Um, it, it's so much easier for that self-giving. And I am a, I, I, yeah, I, I've always been a little uh, sharp tongued <laughs> and it hasn't been, it just, you know, if that, that 
it felt so good to to throw some zingers out here and there. Uh, but now that you know I'm in this sacramental relationship, it, it's become easier for me to put aside my own selfish desires, uh, you know, that, and, and, and actually build a, something good. That's a perfect example of, of what God intends marriage to be. He, he he intends it to be this school of of virtue, you know, wherein the day in give and take of married life is you know as spouses we're interacting with each other and that we're overcoming bad habits, right? We're working sin out of our lives and we're, we're growing in holiness together. And that's a particular, very simple example of how, how marriage does that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, it's called you know, our home and family is a domestic church, the church. It's, right. it's a, a place where we, we are called to greater holiness, but it is a, it's certainly a work exactly in progress. Right. Now I think, <laughs> Absolutely. Now you asked the question, which, which, you know, what, what, what do I want couples to know or what are the things that I think they most need to know? So, I mean, starting with the vocation to holiness and discernment, I think that's, that's bedrock fundamental. Um, I also think is another part of my book is a a proper understanding of, of human sexuality and responsible parenthood and how living out those, you know, living out our sexuality, loving each other as men and women made in the image and likeness of God and subjecting our fertility to God's design, not what we want it to be, but, but living out sex the way God has intended it to be is, an, is a, clearly, I think, an area where, where our culture has lost complete understanding you know, of how sex factors into this vocation of holiness that is marriage and how having children factors into this. Do you get a lot of pushback from couples when it comes to, say, contraception in these? Or do, do you guys not get into that really in these talks that you've done? Oh, sure. I mean, it's, and I try to help the seminarians to, you know, develop ways that they can invite couples to, to understand the church's teaching on responsible parenthood, you know, in a non-confrontational manner, because it's, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, our, our culture is thoroughly contraceptive. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the numbers of Catholics even who supposedly, you know, practice natural family planning is less than 10%. You know, and, so you, you have to enter into these discussions assuming that you're going to, you know, receive pushback or people are going to be incredulous or have a lot of questions or be very concerned. It's, that's to be expected. But, but the, the goal is to try, um, and I'm trying, I've tried to do as my best in the, in the book too, is to help young couples understand that the church's teachings are not a bunch of rules to abide by. And they're certainly not trying to make sex less fun for us, you know, as if the church like hates sex and it, as if Jesus hates sex. You know, what, what the church teaches in these areas is simply preserving God's plan for sexual loving. And it's that plan and that plan alone that leads to true sexual freedom. You know, not the sexual freedom of the 60s, which was a bunch of lies, you know, which is about sexual license and, and having as much sex as we want without ever having to think about babies and having now as many babies as you want without ever having to think about sex but actually living in accord with God's design for sexual loving is the only type of sexual freedom that's worth anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my husband really loves um, philosophy and uh, he's just our, our resident expert in the house on natural um, uh, natural law theory. And so once mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I always was more, uh, I, I didn't like the idea of uh, artificial contraception anyway. It just wasn't something that I, I felt good about. Uh, I, I grew up with uh, more natural-minded uh, parents and, and whole foods and all that stuff. Uh-huh. So the idea of like good hormones green. or whatever, yeah, just, <laughs> just it seemed a little um, unreasonable. But, uh, you know, understanding, you know, y- you can get to... Um, uh, the the beliefs against contraception and uh, and the beliefs for natural family planning from a philosophical standpoint of what we are created to do as humans anyway, I mean just as you know we yes. derive that the the pleasure that we derive from eating is um, secondary to the fact that we're getting nutrition that's the the purpose of it so the pleasure we get from the sexual act is auxiliary to the purpose of it which is contraception. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, con- conception. <laughs> um, so you, you can, this isn't just, you know, looking from the outside in for a long time as being pretty anti-Catholic. I was like, oh, it's just the patriarchy and, and people, you know, old white men just want to create rules and, and make things not fun. <laughs> right. But it, it's not, it, it really is for our own flourishing and it is 
something that we can easily see, even from a philosophical standpoint, it isn't just these arbitrary rules being handed down. Right. In, in none of the Catholic Church's moral teachings are because we're Catholic. In other words, you know, the, mor- the moral teachings are because we're human. Right. So the, Catholic, the Church doesn't present these teachings, well, only Catholics need to pay attention to these things. It's, no, it's because we're human. These are types of behaviors that lead to our perfection, that lead to our happiness, that lead to our flourishing. And the opposite kinds of behaviors will lead us into not so fun places. Yeah, even if they are dressed up and look pretty at the beginning. Correct, Um, yeah. Yeah. That's really, yeah, that's, that's the one I I know uh, when I tell people, when they see actually our family size, we have four kids now. Um, they kind of, and, and it's every other year and I don't know, they, they, I get chuckled, people chuckle uh, at, uh, at our natural family planning. <laughs> um, but that seems to be the one thing as a, a Catholic and finding out that we don't agree with contraception is, is probably one of the, cause it, for whatever reason, that's the, the whole culture is just obsessed with sex. So it, the fact that, right. you know, it's more freeing and yet people think it's more restrictive. It's, it's an interesting Oxymoron, it is an interesting conundrum. And it's, as you, as you said, like the, the church's teachings are based upon natural law. So when you look at, I used to, when I taught at a, a liberal arts college, um, I used to lead the, the kids through, a, the kids, the young adults, <laughs> through a thought exercise when, we, when I, in the course on marriage that I taught, where I'd say, you know, okay, um, when you look at sex, what is it for? So like if you were uh, from, an, from another planet, and you plop down on earth and somebody gave you a book of human anatomy or biology to read. And at the end of reading that book, you were asked, well, what is this act for? And so the, always when I ask that question, one of the kids in the, in the room would raise their hands and say, well, it's, it's for babies. Ding, ding, ding. You know, great. Correct. Right. It's, it's plain as nose on your face. This act is meant for procreation. Right. And then I would ask, well, is it for anything else? And somebody else would raise their hand. Yeah. I think it's for like, expressing love, you know, bonding the couple together. Yeah, great, right? So you got procreation and, and union, the, the fancy words that the, that the church uses, mm-hmm. procreative and unitive act, ends of the act, or purposes of the act. And then I would ask, you know, just for, for fun to continue the conversation, is, does anybody think that sex is for anything else? And always, I think this just shows, shows the way, the difference between the way guys and, and girls are wired, always a guy in the class would raise his hand and he would say, yeah, I think sex is for pleasure. And uh, I would then say, well, that's, that's interesting. You know, clearly sex has a lot of pleasure attached to it. Does anybody see anything wrong with saying that the purpose of sex is pleasure? Always without fail, a young woman in the class would raise her hand. <laughs> and, and this, there was one year that this young woman who's actually one of the brightest and most blunt students I ever had in class. She, she raised her hand and she said, yeah, she said, you know, I think there is something wrong with that she said because if that's if that's the purpose for sex if that's what sex is for then i don't need anybody else for that yeah which was kind of abrasive and everybody kind of got wide eyes but it, and then she went on to say and the other person just fades away from the act and, and that's always stuck into my mind and i think it was a perfect way to articulate you know what's wrong if we lose sight of the god-given purposes of sex if we start sh- tricking ourselves you know, to think that sex is for pleasure, just as the example you gave, if we trick ourselves into think that, thinking that eating is for pleasure, you know, but in the act of sexual intercourse, the other person just becomes extraneous to the act. Right. And again, it goes back to that idea that what, you know, we are just islands of one and we may include somebody else in, but that's at our discretion. And that's right. how we approach marriage nowadays as well. Yes, that's exactly right. right. We're just two islands that happen to live in the same house. Right. And as long as you're meeting my needs and I'm meeting yours or we're mutually pleasuring each other, this is a mutually beneficial relationship. It'll go on. But if, you know, if it's not, then we'll, we'll cut this off. How utilitarian. And they say that, (laughs) and you know, the critics will say that a Catholic marriage is oppressive, but that really is, it's, it's putting somebody at the, uh, they're enslaving them to their own whims. Exactly right. And I think that vision of the Catholic marriage as being oppressive or the church making marriage oppressive, it somehow has to do with, you know, this, the, the, the value that, the, that we as Catholics place on life and that the fact that you see a lot of different Catholic families that have large numbers of children. Well, it doesn't mean, you know, responsible parenthood, which, by the way, is a phrase that Paul VI used in his encyclical Humanae Vitae. You know, it, it doesn't mean every time you have sex, you have to have a kid, <laughs> right? 
it means exactly what we're saying, responsible. So yeah. take into account that your situation in life, the circumstances in your household, the, you know, the, your health, your finances, all a myriad of different things. You work with God's design for sex and you don't enter into this act unless you're willing to, right? Welcome, be willing to, uh, to open, be open to and welcome another child. Which even with contraception, that could happen anyway. So you might as well work with God. Right. I mean, it's always seemed to be ironic to me that, you know, contraception has certain side effects, which nobody will escape. You know, there, there are these, you know, people want to point out that some of the more serious ones may not happen to pe- to women unless they're older or smoking or whatever, but there are certain side effects that most women, if not all women will if, experience, namely weight gain, irritability, and a decrease in, lobe- in libido. Mm-hmm. And it has never made sense to me why, we think it's a good thing for women to take a pill, which supposed to, supposedly is tr- trying to make them as, as sexually available as possible, but at the same time yeah. makes them want sex less, makes them feel fat, right? And, and just makes them feel overall irritable. Yeah, well, I, that's a really good question. <laughs> I, I don't have a good answer for that one. I, I was on, I've, I've done that myself and really felt miserable. Felt like a monster living in the house suddenly, so... That was, that was given the boot very quickly in my, when I was right. younger. And, and to get it's awful. To, right. And to get back to your kind of natural law point, like here's, to me, this is something that our whole society should, should, should sit up and take a look at at some point. You know, the, the definition of medicine is it's supposed to, to, to promote the proper functioning of the human organism. That's what medicine is supposed to do. Contraceptive medicine, so-called, is the only area of modern medicine where we look at a perfectly functioning system of the human body. And our whole goal is to make it function improperly. (laughs) You know, shouldn't we expect certain things to go wrong if that's what we're doing? Yeah. That's really interesting. It's all the same thing calling abortion healthcare. Right. It's it's a similar argument. So to get back to the positive point, um, you know, to try to help couples understand that what the church is teaching in this area is not oppressive. It's not supposed to make their lives difficult. It's supposed to make them free. Does it mean that, that there, won't, there, there won't be sacrifice? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Marriage entails sacrifice across the board, right? And, it, and to work with God's design for sex does mean at times sacrificing one's desires, you know, for sex, be, for the greater good of your, of your family. But it is freeing. And it's, it makes you, it, it actually promotes happiness, not isolation and loneliness and self-absorption yeah well yeah everything yeah when it, it seems from the outside like oh god that is that's that's too much sacrifice for somebody who doesn't understand the full scope of um the sacramental marriage uh, but you know it, it and i always kind of balked at the idea of an authority but now that i am fully embracing the catholic life it, the free, freeing is is a really good word for it and it's it seems counterintuitive but but that's just the way it is it is god and, god, and god i got it right <laughs> right and to be i we haven't mentioned this phrase yet but to, as we're talking about and people are listening you know what, what are we talking about as an alternative to contraceptive behavior well it's, it's generally what's called natural family planning you know, working with God, the, the nature of sexuality, working with the nature of the fertility cycle, largely in a woman's fertility cycle, to know when you're fertile and when you're not. And if you're wanting a baby to have have children, have intercourse during the fertile window. And if you're needing to avoid a child for some reason, that you restrict your intercourse to the times that are infertile. And that's right. working with God's design and working in a healthy way. Right. Yeah. And not just because you, um, you know, want to continue drinking alcohol and, and go on your vacations, but if there really is a, a reason, you know, and, and, and couples would know that, if, especially if they're, they're communicating with one another and they have a good prayer life, they'll, they'll, uh, you know, be able to discern whether or not having a child at that moment is, a, a, you know, in their best interest in their family's best interest. Absolutely. You Absolutely. mentioned Humana Vitae and I haven't really talked yeah. about that on this show before, but I do want real quick. Cause I, I, um, I do want to, before we head off, have everybody uh, hear about where to find your book and, and where to find you. Sure. But I do want to say to anybody listening, if you haven't read that encyclical uh, Humana Vitae, I'll, I'll put a link in cause it's, I mean, the easiest thing to find online. It is, it is um, transformative for married couples, I think. So I would highly recommend uh, reading that. It's not too long. 50 pages. No, it's not at all. And, and I think, you know, unfortunately it's, it's 
often referred to as the, the church document that condemns contraception, but really it should be understood as the church document that, that is, is trying to defend and preserve God's plan for marital love. Yeah. <laughs> That's much more accurate. Yeah. So Perry, thank you very much. Before we go though, where can, sure. um, where can people pick up your, your book, um, Living the Mystery of Marriage? So it's available through liturgical training publications out of uh, Chicago and it's under their Hillenbrand book imprint. Okay. Um, but if they go to LTP, Liturgical Training Publications, they can find it there. Um, I, I'm, the last time I checked, which was a couple of days ago, it says when you look under the uh, in stock heading, it says none in stock, but I think it's because it was just released. So if they place an order, it'll probably, be, it's probably say like back order, but it'll, it, it's, they, it'll it's, be it's delivered coming. soon. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I'll put the link in the show notes of where they can, uh, listeners, you can pick it up just to keep it simple. Perry, do you have a, a website or anywhere that people can reach out to you with any questions that they might have? I don't have my own website. Uh, they can go to the, uh, to the Pontifical College Josephinum website, and they'll find me listed under faculty. Okay. So can... if, if people would like to, uh, to find me and engage me in conversation, I'd be happy to do so. That's awesome. And I, I, my, my husband has his own podcast and he, uh, he'll say, oh, I'm going to have so-and-so on. Or I, I started emailing so-and-so. I was like, well, how did you get that person? He's like, well, he's a professor. I wound, I found his, <laughs> his uh, college email address and emailed him and he answered me. So right. it's, <laughs> yep. you got to, yeah, you actually check those emails. It's good. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Perry. This has been really interesting. I, I hope I just, you know, I'm, I'm just scrolling through the, the table of contents now on your book and it's so as I'm looking at it, man, everything I would, I would love to spend time talking about each of these chapters. So please uh, listeners, I will put the link in the show notes for this. I think it's just a, a fantastic book and I love the, like I said, that, that FAQ, but also those kind of more introspective questions to help make sure that people are getting, getting this. And it, the, the whole idea of a, the sacrament of marriage is we're actually, my husband and I, you know, we, we got married three total times. Once, if you're going to call it marriage, once in the uh, international uh, terminal at the Philly airport, another time in, um, in California, and then finally on Easter Monday, which would just have been about two years ago and a couple of days, uh, where we got married in the church, and it was supposed to just be the priest blessing the marriage after uh-huh. daily mass, but it so happened that the homily that day was about living your faith and being a light for it in the world. And so before daily mass was over, he called us up and we may have got married in front of a bunch of strangers and my parents and our, our three at the time, three kids. And we wound up making like light, you know, great friends <laughs> because people That's were coming great. up afterwards, tears in their eyes telling, Oh, we needed to see that. Thank you. But it was that, that is the most meaningful one. You know, the one that we didn't expect to really have and weren't really, you know, it wasn't, like I was wearing a wedding dress or anything, but it really, it, that is, you know, our conversion to the Catholic faith clearly made things in our, in our whole home life much, much better. But when we, you know, decided to make it a sacrament, that, that covenant, it, it was just transforming. And see, and just see on that one given day, how much your sacrament impacted other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not just us. And I think that's, you know, we're so accustomed to self-gratification and just me, me, me. It's, it's not, I can see now why, you know, marriage is, it's not just between two people at the very least, or, you know, it's, it's between those two people and God, <laughs> but yes. then there is all these other, you know, those graces flow out from, from that. Yes, Absolutely. Well, cool. Perry, thank you again. Um, and listeners, if you have any questions for Perry, I'll, I'll put the link on where to find him in the show notes, but also, you know, feel free to send a note, any follow-up questions to me, Christine at the Catholic And all right, everyone until next time. Thanks, Christine. Don't forget to head over to the Catholic to get your free copy of how to talk to your kids about God. This handy little ebook will teach you how to broach the topic of God with your children or how to respond to your kids when they want to talk about God, as well as give you answers to seven of the trickiest questions about the faith that Christian parents face. You'll love the easy to understand grown up answers, the pared down but not talked down answers you can share with your kids, plus recommended resources if you'd like to deepen your understanding of the topic. Get yours free at thecatholicmama.com. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul, 
and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.